Look, this nigga killed his own father. What, you talking about this pussy-ass nigga off this pops? Yeah. Fuck it, I'll do it. Now, Kane's obsession with Tariq St. Patrick is something that has become more and more of a problem because it's his obsession which has made him make impulsive moves and mistakes, which has landed not just himself in trouble, but also the rest of the Tahadas, Tariq and Zeke, especially after killing Ramirez, who is a cop, and shooting Jabari, a Stansfield professor. So in this video, we're gonna be dissecting Kane Tahada, how dangerous he's shown he can be, his flaws and mistakes, but also how we shouldn't be underestimating Kane, especially after he was mentored by Mecca, as well as rounding everything off with some thoughts and theories for what's next for Kane in season 3. But let's start by rewinding it back to the beginning of Power Book 2 Ghost. In season 1, Kane was introduced as the eldest son of Monet and Lorenzo, although season 2 did throw us a curveball, with Zeke being Monet's eldest, and we'll get to that later. But Kane was introduced as someone who thrives in chaos and violence, and quickly showed us he was built for the street life. We saw him instantly make an impression by killing Rel, but it was his hot temper and jealousy which caused him a lot of issues when it came to the family business. Kane was volatile and aggressive, and showed why he was Monet's right hand man. He quickly showed he was willing to do whatever his mother asked, and whatever was necessary to protect his family, even if it meant killing people like Uncle Frank. And so in season 1, it started with Kane taking orders from Monet, but even though Kane embodied the street life and was a muscle, he came across someone who was streets ahead of him in terms of intelligence, Tariq St. Patrick. A fucking rat. The fuck you say? What nigga you ain't noticed? How you think he got out early? If Frank was that close with your pops, then your pops would've known it told Monet. But you know, rats get out quick and quiet before anyone even notices. Instantly, Kane becomes jealous of Tariq, because he turns out to be the son Monet's always wanted. But this wasn't just Kane's only problem. He thought being the eldest and muscle to the Tahadas, he was next in line to take over the Tahada operation. But he quickly showed through his impulsive actions, he was nowhere near ready to become a leader. It was also a trait which he actually gets from his father, and we all saw his impulsive move he made in Season 2 by killing Zeke, who he thought was Mecca. But bringing it back to Season 1, decisions were then made to drop the GTG in favour of Tariq St. Patrick, which of course didn't go down well with Kane, especially because this decision was made without him, but it was also a stark reminder to him. All he was at the time was the muscle. With teams, different people play different positions. You are not a decision maker. What you did with Guap, that's what you do best. That's your lane. Stay in it. And Monet continued to force Kane to stay in his lane in favor of Tariq. And so it was this desperate need for approval, as well as him wanting to protect his family, made him make another impulsive decision by putting Braden and Trace Weston on the corner of Queens, something which almost came back to haunt him in season two but also still has him on the radar of Jenny Sullivan, which does mean he may yet face more trouble in Season 3, but that's something I'm gonna dissect later on. But this was a hint at what was to come for the Tahadas, and especially Kane's relationship with Monet, him standing up to Monet and questioning her decision making, because we saw more of it in Season 2, especially from both Drew and Diana. But this exchange led to Lorenzo teaching Kane a lesson on never putting his hands on his wife, a dialogue which confused many, and did bring up the theory of whether Kane was actually Lorenzo's son, but this theory was put to bed by Courtney Kemp, along with the events of Season 2. Now, with everything that happened with Kane's jealousy over Tariq, to his position with the Tahadas, and the beatdown at the hands of a few prison guards on the orders of Lorenzo, Kane showed his naivety once again, this time teaming up with Guap and the GTG, which ended up with him being scooped up by the cops. But Ramirez was always on hand to sweep up any mess involving the Tahadas, and that's why he was so important to Monet. He was always on hand to help the Tahadas, but with Kane's obsession with Tariq growing day by day, along with a failed attempt to kill him at Stansfield, this made him look down another path to get rid of Tariq, and it involved the use of Officer Ramirez. But it was when Ramirez refused, where we saw one of many occasions where Kane went against the family, and this badge really did become important in Kane's role in framing Tariq in Season 2. But the other moments of Kane going against the family were, of course, the obsession with getting rid of Tariq, but let's not forget about Kane's selfish move with the GTG. Now, we saw the GTG coming after Zeke after the death of Boz, and instead of killing Guap, Kane made a deal with him instead, which really did show where his current mindset was at the time. He had this desperate need for approval, respect, and this position of power, and if he wasn't going to get this from Monet and Lorenzo, he was willing to go out there and get this himself, by any means necessary. Okay, I'm playing by her fucking rules. 
So which is it, Drew? Because either you with me, or you against me. But it is fair to say, Kane went the wrong way about everything from killing Ramirez to working with the GTG to trying to take out Tariq, which only gave Monet even more reasons to trust Tariq St. Patrick, who did say he was the only one she could trust, which was more so backed up in season 2. But after Drew got shot by Rico, Monet sent him a stark warning. Run, King. Run before I put you down myself. I'm your son just as much as Drew, ma. I did everything you wanted me to do. Don't test me, boy. Never again. Season 1 then ended with the relationship between Kane and the rest of the Tahadas on thin ice. And what really didn't help was Kane shooting Jabari, which had implications that continued on into Season 2. Now, Season 2 started with Kane on his own. We also learned a lot more backstory with how his real name is Lorenzo Tahada Jr. and how his name Kane comes from the nickname Hurricane. But there were a few elements to Kane in Season 2, and Mecca's mentoring was a continuous theme. Because in Season 1, we established Kane's need for approval, respect, and this position he wanted to acquire in the streets. And if he wasn't going to get this from Monet, then he had no choice but to go out there and get this himself. Stole from your own family. Fuck no. I created an opportunity for them. And they didn't even know they needed. I helped them. Even though Kane did become family first later on, at the beginning of season 2, it was all about how do I get back in the game, even if it meant swapping his own family's product with Sugar. But even with Kane back in the game, it didn't exactly solve all his problems. We talked about how he was impulsive in his decision making, and the fallout from the death of the Sansfield professor was always going to be huge. And so even with Kane and Tariq never being on the same page, he had no choice but to trust him. But along with working with Tariq and the Tahadas, Kane needed to learn how to control someone like Tariq St. Patrick, which was one of Mecca's long list of lessons for Kane. So you want me to get at Tariq and Braden? You want to run Tariq? You need to cut him at his soft spot, and that rich kid is it. You need to get Braden in your pocket. This was Mecca mentoring Kane and telling him Braden was Kane's way of controlling Tariq. And with Tariq's busy life from trying to study to the court case with his grandma, looking after Yaz and trying to move product, it's easy to see why he didn't notice Kane's control over Brayden. Not to mention, Kane was constantly putting pressure on Tariq, especially with how Zeke was caught up in the mess. But even with everything that happened from watching Tariq killing Jabari to taking control over the situation, Kane never took Tariq seriously. He always referred to him as Silver Spoon. And so he made yet another impulsive move on Tariq this time with Ramirez's badge, not realizing that he and Tariq were in this together. Kane's obsession with Tariq and constantly coming over to Stansfield also ended up with him being picked up on Lauren's Rolex, which was a recording device, something which may still land him in hot bother in Season 3. But it's also a reason why he asked Brayden to get rid of Lauren, because he knew the street code, and so did Effie. And this is another reason why Tariq doesn't trust Kane. Hey, you know my girl, Lauren? You ain't risking your life for some shit you don't know. Why are you always worried about me when you need to worry about what it is that you need to do? And it definitely is true. Kane has been so caught up with his obsession over Tariq. He doesn't even realize what it takes to do some of the things Tariq has done in power. For example, killing his father. So it was all good Kane saying, fuck it, he'll do it. But when it came down to it, we all know he wasn't ready to kill someone he loves. Now, Season 2 also did give us a glimpse of potentially a future conflict with Drew and Kane. And this is what Corny Kemp had to say on both of them. Kane is a little bit modelled after Sonny Corleone. For those who are Godfather fans, we really wanted that energy, that kind of hot-headed energy. And Drew has a little bit of Michael Corleone. Now, Sonny Corleone was the oldest, most impulsive and violent of the Vito sons, and he was supposed to take over the family business, but it was actually Michael who eventually took over. And so from season 1, Lorenzo made it clear he wanted Drew to take over the family operation, but it only became apparent to Kane after Lorenzo was released, and this did cause a bit of tension. I'm trying to give you this game, so you can sustain and put Diana and Kane in position, so you can run this shit. Now, albeit Kane was being manipulated by Mecca, the guidance and mentoring he received is what will make Kane that much more dangerous in Season 3. And no doubt, he will be out for what he believes to be his. But if Drew forgets about Ev and realizes his destiny lies in the streets, it may be an interesting head-to-head -head with his brother. 
So where's his next for Kane in Season 3? Now, this relationship with Tariq St. Patrick will no doubt start with them working together, but will it last? I don't think so, especially because we all know Kane. He's probably gonna end up making a move, but after the stun he pulled with Ramirez's badge, Tariq will be thinking, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer with Kane, and I doubt he's gonna make the same mistake twice. But on the other hand, Kane is someone who learned a lot from Mecha, and so let's not get it twisted. I don't think we can underestimate Kane. He's gonna be that much more sharper and manipulative. It's just a question of whether he can keep his emotions in check, especially when his back is against the wall. And one of those moments of his back being against the wall could even be with law enforcement. Jenny Sullivan was keeping a close eye on his folder, and so I wouldn't be surprised to see him on the radar, especially with Sax being Jenny's inside man, and with Davis now being involved with the Tahadas. And so there's a connection apart from the recording. Now another element we need to consider is Effie. These are two characters who understand the game and each other. They've also gone behind Tariq's back once before with the Lauren situation, and I really wouldn't be surprised to see it again. So the dynamics and relationship with Effie, as well as Brayden, will definitely be one to keep an eye on. And so with that being said, let me know all your thoughts and theories on all things Kane to Harder for Powerbook 2 Ghost Season 3. And of course, if you are new to the channel and you haven't done so already, then remember to smash the subscribe button if you want to see everything Powerbook 2 Ghost and Power Universe related. But as always, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.